This week on Animal Miracles, heart disease ravages the life of a Texas man until he's united with a miraculous dog named Dakota. See how one dog saves the lives of both his owner and complete strangers in this unbelievable story of faith and friendship. I believe now in, in destiny. I, uh, not sure I did before that, <laughs> but I think somebody put two paths together. Then, after years of unconditional love, service, and companionship, a tragic accident threatens to destroy a family. They usually pull you back. In this case, because the car was too close, Shadow decided to uh, cut in front of me and knock me down, get me out of the way of the car. And he, he got hit. But first, after saving the life of stroke victim Ken Banks, the tiny terrier known as Cookie falls to certain death in the frigid waters of a raging river. 15 minutes in this cold river is a long time. Um, I don't think most people would have survived in that. Only the power of their miraculous friendship can save them. These stories and more this week on Animal Miracles. You may have noticed that we love stories about animals rescuing people. Today we're pleased to say that miracles go both ways. Here's the story of a remarkable relationship that nearly ended in tragedy one evening if it weren't for a miracle. The kind that can spring from anywhere and nowhere. Eight years ago, Ken Banks suffered a massive stroke. Ken had always been very active, and being robbed of his ability to comprehend, read, and speak left him frustrated and depressed. Ken's wife, Sonia, helped him in his difficult recovery. He found it very difficult after he first had the stroke because he used to get so many bad headaches. There was a lot of emotional turmoil. It was very difficult. I can't pretend that it wasn't. But Ken Banks is a fighter. He worked hard, struggling against the debilitating effects of the stroke. Then someone came into Ken's life that made a miraculous difference. A little dog named Cookie. Cookie out. belongs to an old friend of Ken and Sonia's, Nicole Gagnon. Ken offered uh, if he could go and walk Cookie when I was at work. So what I did is I gave him the key. He comes in twice a day and he takes Cookie for a walk. And it's good for Ken too. He needs to feel that he's useful that is accomplishing something, and he loves Cookie. Nicole lives in New Westminster near Vancouver. Her home is perched along the Fraser River, the largest river in British Columbia. The Fraser's cold, murky waters hide rapidly shifting currents, but up on the waterfront pier, the view is spectacular, and it's a perfect place for a walk. Doug Laney, who gives tours of the river on his paddle wheeler, got to know Ken and Cookie well. Ken's probably one of the best known people on the boardwalk. We'd see him sitting outside at the coffee shop and uh, he's in one chair, Cookie's sitting in the chair beside him and uh, you almost expect to see Cookie drinking a cup of coffee as well. They're, they're very close. I, I'd say Cookie's Ken's best friend. But no one realized the depth of love that Ken and Cookie had for one another until one fateful night. It was two days before Christmas. It was already dark when the two friends left Nicole's house and set off down the pier for their last walk of the day. It was a frigid night, and both Ken and Cookie were bundled up against the cold. Along the way, they met Doug. And as I was walking down the boardwalk, Ken was coming toward me. And this was a cold night. It was really cold. As always, of course, uh, we stopped and, and had a little chat there. Cookie was behind him. And all of a sudden, I see her back end slip off the, the dock. She slipped off and fell in the river. Ken was going to jump off of the side of the railing right then. I would not let him do that. Uh, I said, Ken, we've got to find out some other way to get her, because 
I didn't know what's down there. There's always logs in the river. It could have been very shallow. He could have really injured himself. Whoa, don't jump in. You might get hurt. I'm going to go and get help. As Doug ran to the paddle wheeler, Ken saw Cookie struggling in the current. There was no time to lose. I just headed straight for my boat. I went up to the wheelhouse, got on the radio. Now, this is the paddle wheeler native. I'm calling for help. We've got a small dog that's fallen into the river, and I'm afraid that the owner's going to be following him in. Ignoring the danger to himself, Ken made a fateful decision. As Ken searched frantically in the dark, he feared the river's currents had swept Cookie away. Cookie was in trouble. Her knitted coat, meant to keep her warm in the cold air, was now waterlogged and dragging her down. Only yards from Ken, Cookie was frantically paddling, desperately trying to stay afloat. But Ken couldn't see her in the dark waters. Just when it looked as if all was lost, a crew boat arrived, rounding the corner behind the paddle wheeler. There he is. Doug shouted directions as the crew on the boat swept the waves and pillars with their searchlight. Ken stared into the contrasts of dark and light. Where was Cookie? Had she been swept away? Was she already drowned, submerged under the black water? Then Ken saw a flash of orange. It was Cookie's motionless form. The frigid river and waterlogged coat had quickly overcome the tiny dog. Ken frantically struggled to revive her. Cookie was lifted from Ken's upraised hands and taken back to the paddle wheeler. I don't know how many people would have done what he did. He had no idea how deep the water was when he jumped in, because you can't see anything around it that would indicate a depth. We rubbed the dog, and we did get water out of her, as, as opposed to breathing freely. She was kind of bubbling, and uh, so we knew that she had taken on a fair bit of water. 15 minutes in this cold river is a long time. Uh, I don't think most people would have survived in that. And when he came onto the boat, he showed no effects from it at all. He wasn't shivering, he was lucid, and uh, uh, all he was concerned about was, how is Cookie, is Cookie gonna make it? It was a sad day for us because we really were not too sure that Cookie was gonna make it. And that would have been such a blow to Ken. It would have been uh, just, just devastating. Nicole opened her door to find Cookie in bad shape. Cookie was moaning. She was shaking quite a lot, and I knew something really bad had happened. Cookie was suffering from hypothermia. Nicole quickly put her in the bathtub and bathed Cookie in lukewarm water to try and raise her body temperature. Then Nicole realized that Ken was just as wet and icy cold as his tiny friend. So I said to Ken, Ken, you better go home and change and have a hot shower, because I was worried about him too. Huh? Yeah. Okay. And I wrapped her up in a towel and I sat beside the fireplace, I stroked her and talked to her and saying that she was going to be okay, everything's going to be fine. And I, I didn't know if she was going to make it or not. At home, all Ken could think about was Cookie. Ken, I would say, didn't sleep very well that night. He was very agitated, very upset, you know, reliving the whole thing. Early the next morning, Ken and Sonia rushed over to Nicole's, afraid of what they would find. I think we got there about 9, 9.30 that morning. Hi, Ken. Hi, Sonia. <laughs> and Cookie just came flying to the door as though nothing had happened. It was a sigh of relief that everything was back to normal and really quite amazing for both of them. 
That day and every day since, Ken and Cookie have gone for their walk by the river. This had to be probably one of the greatest Christmas stories that, that we've ever been involved with. This is a miracle, you know, that, uh, that the dog survived. And you should have heard my whole crew. It was, uh, it was uh, you know, everybody cheered. I'm a believer, and I really believe that uh, Ken must have his garden angel, too. I really believe there's somebody up there that's watch over us. And that's why they're still alive today. <laughs> Stay with us for more miraculous stories. When heart disease steals a Texas man's will to live, only a dog can show him the miracle of life. Next on Animal Miracles. We've looked before at stories about heroic dogs, intelligent dogs, even dogs trained to perform remarkable acts. But sometimes a story comes along that challenges our long-held understanding of dogs. In our next story, we meet a dog whose God-given abilities would seem to defy explanation. Until about 10 years ago, Mike Lingenfelter was a very healthy and happy man. But then he was struck down by heart disease, and it plunged him into an abyss of despair. Well, back in uh, 1992, uh, I had my first heart attack. I had a 99% blockage of the left main, a 99% blockage of the right main. And left main blockage, you just don't live from. Although Mike did live, it was not in a way that he found worthwhile. I was burdened with uh, a lot of pain and suffering, actually, to the point to where I just couldn't work. I was on so many pills, I'm not sure who was controlling what where. And I think that was the beginning of a lot of my other problems. I eventually drug myself down to the point where uh, I just didn't care anymore. And it was getting worse on a daily basis. In anybody's life, there's two very important things, your family and your work. And when I lost my work, uh, it started to impact my family. I know that my life would have ended. I was preoccupied with trying to figure out how to end it. Just when his life seemed to be at its darkest point, there came a small ray of light. A golden retriever named Dakota was about to enter Mike's life. Uh, the Golden Retriever uh, Rescue Club of Greater Houston had gotten a call that there was a golden retriever chained up in the backyard of this house. And when they got there, they found a dog that there was a, a stake in the yard and a big chain. And, and here was this rundown dog that was dying of heartworms. Dakota knew something about heart failure. While being treated for heartworm, his own heart stopped beating. And they were able to get him revitalized. They stopped the heartworm treatment and uh, started to back up again and was able to cure him. Because of his good nature and willingness to please, Dakota began training as a therapy dog, and eventually a doctor prescribed him for Mike. But initially, Mike, still depressed, was hesitant. On the way home, I told my wife we weren't keeping them. I said, that dog's going back. I don't want that thing. It's obnoxious. And by the time we got in the house with him, he was really becoming obnoxious. And uh, she insisted that we keep him over the weekend. I think he kept me up all night. You know, he uh, wanted in bed. He kept squeaking his frog. He wanted me to take him outside to let him go to the bathroom. By the time Monday had come, why we were inseparable. With Dakota by his side, Mike felt as if his life was starting over again. Uh, we started walking first. It was the end of the first block. And of course, people, he, he has a way of attracting people. So I would talk and walk and be gone for a while. And the walks became bigger and the exercise became better. Six months after Dakota's arrival, Mike no longer needed antidepressants. He was able to start on a new path in life, teaching others about the important work service dogs do. 
Then one day, Mike discovered having Dakota by his side was going to be far more valuable than just moral support. And Dakota's a very well-behaved little dog. If you tell him to lay down and stay, that's where he stays. That's what he does. And all of a sudden, he started to act up. He was pushing on me and pulling on me and carrying on. And I was getting angry at him because I was embarrassed. I'm telling the kids how well they behave, and here's this dog going, starting to go ballistic. I decided to take him outside. I, I just didn't know what the problem was, but he was embarrassing me. I got over to the doors, and that's when it hit me. And I just had a very big weight hit me on the chest, and it put me down. When Mike regained consciousness, Dakota was at his side. What well, the next thing I remember was Dakota licking on my face and my neck, trying to, you know, take care of me. Dakota had miraculously given Mike advance notice of a cardiac episode. Mike immediately went to his doctor, who gave him a prescription to stabilize the condition. Medical experts believe that Dakota's sensitive nose has something to do with recognizing changes in Mike's physiology before a heart attack. So he had probably seen a hundred of these incidents or more, and I think he just started to figure out that when this funny peculiar smell came around that you know, I was about to have trouble and he didn't want me to have trouble. Uh, it's just second nature with me. I know that if he nudges me, I need to get medicine in me. And I know that if he settles down, the medicine's working. I don't have to call anybody. I know that if I see him starting to relax, that things are okay. You know, that I'm gonna be all right. Mike felt so good that he was soon back to his old job with his new friend by his side. The amazing thing was with him going to work with me, I was handling it, okay, it was doing good. So uh, we became productive again and we started to accept our responsibilities as a man being financial and taking care of our family again. One day at work, Dakota showed Mike he was willing to share his mysterious ability. Bill was uh, probably a good 50 feet away from me in another cubicle. Dakota just got up and uh, started out of the office. And he just ignored me, and that's not his nature. And he just, he just kept going. I mean, it was like, I have something else to do down here. Mike's co-worker had no idea whatsoever anything was wrong. Bill was sitting there working on his computer like nothing was wrong. I mean, he was, he was fine. And uh, Dakota was becoming more and more agitated because we weren't paying attention to it. And we I told him, I said, go, we got to get you to a doctor. You're sick. Are you feeling all right? Mike, I'm OK. I'm OK. I'm all right. Based on Dakota's diagnosis, Bill went to the doctors and collapsed in full cardiac arrest. So uh, he was very sick, and he just didn't know he was sick. Uh, I, I don't think there's any question that Bill's life is, is, uh, has been saved by Dakota. Knowing Dakota could sense impending trouble, Mike was given a freedom he never thought he'd have again. I still had chest pains. I still had angina attacks. But he was forecasting them, and he was telling me about it. My life today is fulfilled. Uh, I've had three heart attacks that any doctor will tell you I should be, shouldn't be here. I accept life for what it is. I get out of bed every morning and say, thank you, God, for giving me today, and I go on. Uh, my life has been given back to me. And Mike saves his deepest thanks for the greatest gift of all. I believe that Dakota has taught us that our problems aren't as big as what we thought they were. I know he's an angel because I've seen the angels in his eyes. Next on Animal Miracles. The life of a special young girl is forever changed by an orphan dolphin. When we return. Animal Miracles will continue. Legends have persisted for centuries about dolphins saving the lives of desperate humans at sea. Very few documented cases have surfaced. But our belief in the compassion and intelligence of marine mammals is stronger than ever. Here's the story of a young girl and her family 
who believe that dolphins can enrich our lives in ways we never could have imagined. The Clearwater Marine Aquarium in Florida is a special place for special marine mammals. It's a sanctuary for injured creatures who would not otherwise survive without the help of dedicated volunteers. Scott Swaim has been the program's director for eight years. The animals that come here are normally in pretty bad shape. All the animals we get, we try to rehab them and release them in the minimum amount of time possible. But occasionally, an animal cannot be released because it would not survive in the wild. There's Mo, a 350-pound loggerhead sea turtle. He was born with a birth defect in his shell uh, that created his uh, buoyancy issues. And uh, the buoyancy problem is a big, big problem for sea turtles because if they cannot control their buoyancy, they can't eat, they can't protect themselves. Then there's Sunset Sam, an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin. He stranded in old Tampa Bay, uh, had numerous uh, problems at the time pox virus, parasites, pneumonia. He's uh, partially blind in his right eye. Uh, he also has a permanent liver disorder. Mo and Sunset seem pretty content in their adopted home, and that's in part due to the visits of a little girl named Danielle. And you like to go to the aquarium? Yes. Who do you play with at the aquarium? Mo. Mo, he's a big what? A big turtle, I just pet him. Like Mo the turtle, Danielle was born with a chromosome abnormality. Danielle has Down syndrome. Danielle um, started occupational therapy at two months old. She ended up having open heart surgery at six months old. And uh, physically, she was behind. So she has been in therapy for all her life. Looking for new ways to help her four-year-old daughter, Amy Caravino enrolled Danielle in a program at the aquarium called Full Circle. We're putting children with special needs with animals with special needs, and they're both giving back to each other. Uh, the animals are giving something to the children in an educational uh, way as well as in enriching their lives, and the children are giving back to the animals by helping care for them and, and giving them an enrichment. So it all comes back full circle. It's special needs children taking care of special needs animals, taking care of children. Okay, grab hold of the bucket and take it over there to Dawn for me, okay? And I'll get you some fish. So in the Full Circle program, food preparation for a special friend is the motivation for learning a multitude of brand new skills. Very good. Why don't you count five things out for Sunset? That's one. What's next? What's after one? The needs of the animals and the needs of the children run very parallel. Uh, the animals need something special in their lives. The children need the same thing. They need a special care. They maybe need uh, to go a little bit slower. Uh, they may need to have things explained to them a little differently. And it's the same thing with the animals, from, from painting to uh, uh, throwing balls to jumping and spinning and getting rings. And all the things that Sunset does uh, are enrichment, our husbandry behaviors that we do with him to enrich his life because he can't be released back in the wild. And when you feed Sunset, what do you do with Sunset? First you feed him? Yeah. You throw the fish? Yeah. And then how do you make him jump? Like this. You go like this. Danielle is enthusiastic about her visits with Sunset now, but it wasn't always the case. Danielle was afraid of Sunset because the dolphin makes noises when he's jumping or when he's happy and you, you can't control that. So it would just be alarming to her, these loud noises, and she would cry. But Sunset seems to understand. He will sit there with his mouth open and wait for Danielle to throw the fish right in his mouth. Even Mo makes a special effort. Mo comes over because he wants to. It's a feeling that you get with working with animals that you know there is some kind of connection there. Uh, you know, you look into Mo's big eyes, and you know, no matter what anybody says, anatomy or biologically, what's going on with a turtle? Why else would he stay there? He's got some kind of interest in what's going on. And for Danielle, that interest is translated into an increased attention span. 
She still needs to work on skills, but she kind of is bored with the same rote exercises. And this was learning the same skills, but in a different experience, in a different way, where she was having fun, but she didn't realize she's working on physical therapy, gross motor skills. She was just wanting to get to feed Mo. Is this a cow? No. No. Is it a pig? No. What is it? Squid. Very good. She's come the longest way with Sunset. Definitely a bond there she got working with Sunset. And we're getting her to learn the cause and effect. When we get Danielle to use the hand signal for, for jump, so to speak, and then Sunset will jump in response to her hand signal. So he's doing what she wants him to do. I think having control over Sunset has boosted her confidence. She can do one motion and he will spin around, or another motion and he will jump. And I think that cause and effect um, really motivates her and makes her very enthusiastic to continue to learn. You see a child for a child having a good time. You don't see a child with a disability. I don't see Mo as a turtle with a disability. I don't see Sunset as a dolphin with a disability. I see the animals for being the animals. So the biggest miracle that we see um, is the relationships that she's built you know, with these animals as her friends. When Danielle was first born, Amy felt a bit overwhelmed by the challenges of raising a child with Down syndrome. Why was I so intimidated by this? Because she is more typical than not. And this full circle program has shown that she can do anything that other children can do. So our expectations for her, we weren't sure in the beginning, but now it's to the moon. It doesn't matter. Coming up next on Animal Miracles, Nino Pache and his seeing eye dog Shadow face a devastating accident. Stay with us. Seeing eye dogs have always helped people lead safe and independent lives. The bonds between the blind and their canine companions is miraculous in itself. But in our next story, we'll meet a man who learned one morning that his best friend was prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice. Twelve years ago, Nino Pache suddenly lost his sight due to a rare medical condition. One day he could see, the next he was blind. But Nino, with the help of guide dogs, was determined to live a rich and active life. The positive nature, I think, saved me and uh, helped me through this. Some blind people have what they call a poor me attitude, not me. And I feel that everyone should be a viable part of uh, the community by uh, doing what they can to get back into society. At 53, Nino had to relearn even the simplest everyday tasks. I went to the Associated Services for the Blind, where I had orientation and rehabilitation for about eight months. Uh, learn how to use a cane and learn how to make a bed, which I knew anyway, but uh, I learned how to cook and how to learn how to do dishes. Guide dogs helped Nino regain his independence and eventually he was paired with a black lab named Shadow. Shadow was my second dog and within two weeks we were bonded together and uh, worked amazingly well. He was a very friendly dog. He loved people. He loved to chase tennis balls, frisbees. He soon discovered Shadow was a very perceptive dog. I think that there were a lot alike. He kind of read my mind uh, a number of times. He, he did read my mind. When we go to church, he would genuflect in church. Nino had always been active in his local church and found great strength in his faith, and Shadow seemed to sense this. If we were up on the altar for some reason, he would never turn his back to the altar. Uh, he would lay you know, in such a way that he was always facing the altar. And I never taught him this. This was him. 
Going to church had become a comfortable routine for Nino and Shadow, but one day this routine was about to be shattered. We we're going to Mass on a weekday morning. It was uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. There was no sidewalk, so Shadow guided Nino along the shoulder of the road, always keeping himself between Nino and the traffic. We were standing at an intersection to cross the street to get to the church. While they waited for the traffic to clear, Shadow kept a keen eye on the cars. As a guide dog, his role was to always be vigilant. A car coming from my left was a little too close to us. A car coming the other way was over the yellow line, and the uh, lady veered to get away from the car. Nino heard a car swerve out of control toward him, but had no time to react. Shadow had to make a split-second decision on his own. The car coming towards us was too close for Shadow to react the right way, and his only reaction was to push me down and get me out of the way. And he, he got hit. Shadow had taken the full impact of the car, risking his life to save Nino's. She hit him without hitting her brake. Uh, and she stopped when she heard the thud. At that point, I didn't care about anything but him. Horrified, Nino didn't know the extent of Shadow's injuries. He went down on his left side. That was the side that was hit. Shadow was in agony, but still struggled to protect his master. Every time I stood up, he would stand up. Basically, he was more concerned about me than he was concerned about himself. And I had to get down on the ground with him at his face and, and had his shoulder or his neck to make sure that he stayed down. The woman that hit the dog, she came over and I tried to tell her that, you know, hey, uh, get a policeman, get him help immediately. Are you sure you're okay? I'm fine, I'm fine. just get some help from the dog. I was afraid he was gonna die on me. When the police arrived, Nino's only concern was Shadow. When the police officer came, I guess Shadow felt that uh, everything was secure, and he stayed on the ground. He did not get up this time. And uh, a police officer said to me, um, well, we'll get you to the hospital, make sure you're okay, and then we'll get him to the vet. I said, no, you're going to do it reversed. He's going to go to the vet first, then we're going to go to the hospital. And the police officer said, you know, no one's ever talked to me like that. We're going to go to the vet first, and then you can take me to the hospital. Sir, you don't understand. I have to take you to the hospital first. No, I have no, to take no, you before the dog. I have to do it my way. The dog must come first. So we took him to the vet, and as it turned out, he had internal injuries. Nino nursed his faithful companion back to health and was constantly at his side. I spent three days on the floor with Shadow after the accident, but I wouldn't leave him because he, he did so much for me. I wanted to be there for him in case he needed me. Shadow's actions that day were extraordinary. They usually pull you back. In this case, because the car was too close, Shadow decided to uh, cut in front of me and knock me down, get me out of the way of the car. But this dog was able to make a decision push me out of the way and allow me to live, I could have gotten killed. We were on our way to church, so I don't know if uh, his guardian angel said, hey man, get him out of the way, I don't know. But uh, yes, it was a miracle and it was, I believe, it wasn't from this, from us. It was from something superior to us. Happily, Shadow recovered, and Nino and Shadow spent two wonderful years together before Shadow passed away peacefully. Although Shadow's original gift to Nino was his vision, it was his generous heart that his master remembers most. And when Shadow passed away... I commended him to the father and asked the father if he would make Shadow the new dog's guardian angel. 
and I made a decision at that point that I wanted the uh, ashes back and that he was to be buried with me when I die. And uh, his ashes are right here and he is part of me. Next, the remarkable story of an autistic young man and the horse that will change his life. When Animal Miracles continues. Horses are powerful, commanding animals with a long history of service to humans. And while horses were commonplace in the cities and towns of our great-grandparents, today horses are mostly found far from city life. For Doug Barker and his family, however, the role of a horse in their daily lives is as profound and important as any cowboy of the Old West. Outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, Doug Barker is on his way to do what he loves to do most of all, ride horses. <laughs> My horse up there. You don't see yours? Why's that the barn? Well, maybe you're They're more than Doug's passion. Horses are his only connection to the outside world. Only a few years earlier, his mother Debbie felt she would never see the day when their son would be able to relate to anything other than his secret private world. When Doug was born, I was told that there was something wrong. It was quite upsetting because we had no idea what autism was. The doctor gave them little hope for their newborn's future. Doug's dad and I were told that Doug would never walk unassisted, that he would not be able to verbalize with other members of the family, that he would have trouble even focusing on feeding himself. Uh, simple things such as uh, putting his shoes on, trying to brush his hair, things that a, a parent uh, is horrified to hear. As Doug got older, he retreated into a distant inner place where no one could follow. They each live in their own different world and they block out everything around them. Doug goes into his room. Music is a number one key for him. He likes the room to be dark, uh, the blinds closed, and in that room, Doug relates with the music. He does his rocking back and forth. Debbie didn't know what future was in store for her autistic son, until one day, Doug had an encounter that would change his life forever. Doug's Aunt Kay has always had a horse and uh, we were just up there letting Doug observe her working with her horse. Debbie couldn't believe what she was witnessing. He was so attracted to the point where the excitement level had just gone sky high. It was almost like someone had switched a light on for him. And by some inexplicable power, Doug was drawn to the horse and he started rubbing the horse. It brought tears to our eyes. We helped put Doug up on that horse's back and Doug just sat up there just like he had done it all his life. The uh, minute that Doug uh, was on the horse's back, I felt like Doug wanted some interaction from the horse. It was uh, quite awesome to, to watch him experience this. From that miraculous moment on, Debbie was intent on pursuing Doug's newfound attraction. She called Teresa Snyder, a local riding instructor and owner of Mitten Tree Knoll Stables. I told her, well, I've never given anybody lessons like that before, but I'd be willing to try. And that was the beginning of a new life for Doug. His mom will pull in and he'll open the door and run out and say hi real quick and run into the barn and grab his halter to go catch his horse. She's out this way. So he'll walk out there real quick, get his horse, and bring it in, and brush it down. Of 
course, I'm there making sure he's doing everything correctly. You're doing good, Tracy. Make sure you brush your good. Start up with the Doug gives her very good eye contact, where that's another um, thing with autism is they will not give you eye contact. Uh, he listens to what Teresa says, and I believe he would do anything that she asked him to do. Oh, you got it figured out good. Very good. Teresa began teaching Doug to care for the horses and to ride them. With each day, he became more connected, confident, and his behavior began to change. It's like he's come out of a cocoon. He's uh, much more social, especially around the uh, horse people. You gotta remember not to pull that hand up. You gotta keep it down so you don't get your reins too tight, okay? But she don't go very fast. The more Doug rode with Teresa, the more Debbie noticed something else that was special about his bond with the horses. Oh, I didn't walk in that room. <laughs> you did good. With the autistic, they like the same everything. In fact, we don't change furniture around in our house because it upsets Doug. But Doug loves all horses. He can ride Bear one day, Cody another day. Doug feels that any horse is his baby. They are truly a miracle as far as Doug's concerned. They don't treat him differently than what some people might, they accept him like he is. Doug doesn't trust all people, but he trusts all horses. Kathy Anthony, Doug's swimming teacher and a close family friend, had gained his trust at an early age. She began to notice dramatic changes in Doug after his visits to the stables. The building of his confidence was a, a key thing. When Doug began to feel better about himself, he was able to do a lot more with swimming and with everything in general. Kathy was so struck by Doug's outgoing nature that she knew he was ready for greater challenges. When the World Games came to Connecticut, um, I just thought it was a good time for Doug to be nominated. His riding had gotten to the point where we felt that he could compete on that level. Doug had never been away from us, and it was quite traumatizing at first for Doug, but once he was around the horses again, he was uh, calmer. Debbie can't explain the miraculous relationship between Doug and Cody, but rider and horse won a bronze medal that day. If we could get inside of Doug and, and understand certain things, but that's Doug's secret, um, and I guess it'll always be his secret, but he has an open love for horses. It's just a miracle to watch them together. Today we've shared a number of stories which illustrate the miraculous bonds between people just like you and me and the animals around us. You be kind to the animals in your world, you'll be glad you did. I'm Alan Thicke and we'll see you next time. <laughs>